Our last case this afternoon will be People v. Pippin. Please proceed. Good afternoon. May it please the Court. Catherine Marcus from the State Appellate Defender Office. Could, could you move that up a little bit so we can? Sure. I mean, move the whole podium oh, up. How do I do that? It's like a lever. There's a button. There you go. I'm the tallest. Okay. Catherine Marcus from the State Appellate Defender Office on behalf of Mr. Roderick Pippin. I'm here with my colleague, Aaron Van Campen. And I'm going to try to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. I know to manage my own time. This case involves a straightforward application of Strickland v. Washington and its central teaching that sound strategy must be based on reasonable investigation. We're here because the lower courts made three critical errors. First, they ignored Strickland's prohibition against hindsight and failed to evaluate counsel's conduct from his perspective at the time. Second, they analyzed this claim as if counsel's only failure here was the failure to call Mr. Hudson as a witness and overlooked his much bigger failure to investigate Mr. Hudson altogether. And finally, the Court of Appeals, which was the only court to evaluate prejudice, made clearly erroneous findings of facts. Um, it failed to take into account the importance of Mr. Hudson's testimony and weigh his testimony against the evidence presented at trial. I'm open to the court's questions at any time. Going to that, so, yes. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll indulge you with questions. <laughs> you bite, invited I'll it. Bite. I'll yeah. bite. Um, so you um, say that the failure of the Court of Appeals was to not talk about the failure to investigate, and that seems that seems right. That failure to investigate is is um, important. It's Wiggins. But what happens if the attorney had investigated? Then do we, or we conclude it's, it fails the performance prong to fail to investigate. But now what do we do? Because do we just assume that a reasonable attorney would have put Mr. Hudson on the stand? Or do we have to ask whether it was professionally irresponsible not to put Mr. Hudson on the stand? What, what, what's my standard at that next step? In Wiggins, the, the court says that we ask, um, is it reasonably likely that competent counsel would have presented this evidence that the investigation um, produced? In that case, it was a mitigation case. But here, is it reasonably likely that competent counsel would have called Mr. Hudson? And if, and if Even so. Even if reasonably competent counsel could have made a different strategic decision about calling Mr. Hudson? That's Absol yes, absolutely. It's an objective standard. It does not turn on the idiosyncrasies of the individual decision maker. It does not matter whether um, trial counsel here, had he um, made, had he investigated, um, could have made an informed decision not to call Mr. Hudson. We ask, but why don't we ask that? Because we're trying to figure out, in order to evaluate the the prejudice prong, we have to know whether it would have made a difference, whether there's a reasonable probability that it would have made a difference to the outcome. Right. And it can only have made a difference to the outcome if Mr. Hudson is ultimately on the stand. So let's say I am a, let's say I'm a reasonably competent attorney and I go and I investigate Mr. Hudson and then I make a strategic decision that is within the range of professional competence mm -hmm. not to put him on the stand. Now, I haven't failed the performance prong, so I obviously haven't failed the prejudice prong. So what do I do? That, that's why I'm, I'm that second step. If he never gets onto the stand and it's a reasonable decision not to put him on the stand, what do I make of the failure to investigate? Maybe the failure to investigate is just just goes away. There are going to be cases where there um, is a failure to investigate. It's deficient performance, and it isn't prejudice. I don't think we can squish the prongs together. Um, and and at, at the heart of Strickland is this deference to trial counsel's tactical decisions and the recognition that 
Trial counsel can make all different kinds of informed tactical decisions in the moment. And the court doesn't want to um, the court doesn't want to take away from that or overturn decisions that were, um, were that were informed and were tactical. But where there isn't that and there is no deference, um, then we have to move on to prejudice and ask, is it reasonably likely had the jury heard this evidence, had competent, would, is it reasonably likely that a competent attorney would have called Mr. Hudson? And had the jury heard this evidence, is it reasonably likely that it would have changed the outcome? So is the easy answer that in, 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 in a case where it's clearly not prejudicial, it's not going to matter that the attorney didn't talk to the witness. We, we can always say there's no prejudice and we don't even have to talk about, we don't have to address Absolutely. strategy. Um, so can we talk about prejudice? What, 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 sure. Why, you know, this, is a, this is not a witness without warts. Um, mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, th 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 he has a criminal history and um, has, you know, other, other potential problems that the Court of Appeals at least identifies. Let me, let me first ask a procedural question. Does it matter that the trial judge didn't make any findings as to prejudice? Or for, for our purposes now, do we just look at the Court of Appeals did it at least, so can we just evaluate what the Court of Appeals thought about prejudice and forget about the fact that the trial judge didn't make any preju prejudice findings? Yes, I think we can. The, the trial court not had an opportunity to do that, had an opportunity to um, opine about Mr. Hudson's demeanor or credibility and did not. And I think we have a sufficient record to determine prejudice from the record. So hum a few bars for me about prejudice. Tell me okay. what's, your, what's your best argument. In assessing prejudice, we have to look at Mr. Hudson against, against the, the full record, against the evidence at trial. This was a, an exculpatory witness who directly contradicted Sean McDuffie, the prosecutor's key witness. And even the trial court said that this case came down to Sean McDuffie. So, you know, that is, that is the background that we're looking at, at Mr. Hudson against. And I think it's really important to look at the kind of witness that Sean McDuffie was. This was, this was a um, informant that had previously been an informant that the police went to with photographs of this crime and photographs of Mr. Pippin. Um, he had a warrant out for his arrest at that time. He agreed to testify um, for a benefit in his own case. He later tried to recant his testimony. He was threatened with perjury. He was brought to court on a material witness warrant um, he then again tried to um, testify that Mr. Pippin had nothing to do with this um, and was um, approached with his testimony from the preliminary examination, which he adopted. And there are problems with that, that testimony itself. Not only was it vague on some, some very important points, but it was also, um, it also contradicted the, the eyewitnesses that were at the scene on other points. The prosecutor was um, in a position to argue that the passage of time and trauma um, were reasons why the jury could, you know, excuse these these discrepancies. Had Mr. Hudson um, been called to, as a witness, he would have been able to say, "No, Sean McDuffie is lying. This did not happen. He was he went to the very heart of the case. He was the only other person." that was um, supposed to have known what happened there that day. And, and that brings up in another sort of Im important point that's part of prejudice. And that's that he, he was a part of this trial, whether trial counsel wanted him there or not. His name was in the prosecutor's opening statement 15 times. The jury was shown a picture of him. And they were allowed to draw a, a negative inference against Mr. Pippin based on his absence. There was this sort of silent corroboration of Mr. McDuffie's testimony. Michael Hudson was there with me. Michael Hudson saw this too. Um, Michael Hudson was just as surprised as I was. So the jury clearly was wondering, as I was when I finished reading the trial, you know, where's Michael Hudson? Why is he not here? So maybe the argument is that the in response to what's so bothering me is that if the attorney had talked to Mr. Hudson, the attorney would have then failed the performance prong by not presenting his testimony. That would be a different case. If the attorney had talked to Mr. Hudson, yeah. 
and investigated. I would still argue that it was objectively unreasonable not to call Mr. Hudson as a witness. Yeah. But we would look at that decision um, with, with so, deference but, but, that we but don't. But the point is, if I agree with you about that, then my little concern goes away about the missing intermediate step. And then we'd have prejudice for all the reasons you just said. Correct. What do you, how, how does it, how, you, you, your client obviously had this problem of having pled guilty to possessing the gun that was used in the homicide, mm -hmm. right? And the, and the, my understanding of the forensic evidence attaching those two, you, you haven't challenged the forensic evidence tying those together and um, your client obviously pled guilty to it. Does that change the way we view the evidence as a whole? I, I, I think the prosecution even concedes that there primary witness had some they serious do. problems. But the gun makes it a little different for your client, doesn't it? The gun is another, another piece of evidence, but it's not overwhelming evidence of guilt. Mr. Pippin was arrested with this gun three months after the murder in this case. There's no evidence tying him to the gun at the time of the murder or at any other time at the time that he was arrested three months later. Um, and, it, and the prosecution's own witness testified that this is a gun that, that he had known to change hands at least a couple times before that. So this, this was a gun um, that was a street gun. Mr. Pippin did not go into a store and buy it. It was changing hands. And the fact that Mr. Pippin had it three months later is not overwhelming evidence of guilt that Mr. Pippin used this gun in this murder. And it's also, I think, critical that that was how Mr. Pippin got on the police's radar. He pled guilty to this gun. The, it was tested. It came back, and it, linked, it was linked to this crime. And then it was at that point that they went to Sean McDuffie with him in mind as a suspect and his photograph and photographs of this crime and, and went to Sean McDuffie asking, what do you know about this and what do you know about Mr. Pippin? It wasn't Sean McDuffie gives this information to the police and then the police search Mr. Pippin's home and lo and behold, there's this gun. Uh, and, and to me, I think that's, that's an important fact to understand. Okay. So I'm going to reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal. Thank you. Well, you should, you should do that at the outset. But we'll let you do that here, but you should do that at the outset. She did. I thought yeah. she did. She did. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Then I apologize. You did. Go ahead. May it please this honorable court, my name is Thomas Chambers, Assistant Prosecuting Attorney, appearing on behalf of the people who are the appellee in this case. I think if, if this court uh, elected to address the prejudice prong first, that might be the easier route. Strickland instructs that if it's easier for a court to resolve the prejudice prong, that, that course should be taken. And in this case, if you, if you address the prejudice prong first, I don't think you need, really need to address the deficient performance prong. In this case, uh, what we had, we, they'd have to show, the defendant would have to show in order to show prejudice that with Michael Hudson's testimony, had he testified consistent with what he testified to at the Ginther hearing, he testified that this incident never happened and, uh, and McDuffie is lying. And you, you'd have that juxtaposited against testimony that, uh, uh, that the Michael Hudson and the defendant were 90 days later were caught um, kicking guns under the car, and one of the guns was, the, was a murder weapon, and Michael Hudson would have been questioned about that at the trial, and he would have, he would have testified, consistent with, with the, the way he testified at the Ginther hearing, that he was not the one that kicked the murder weapon under the car. If that's the case, by process of elimination, it was the defendant who kicked the murder weapon under the car, and contrary to the defense argument, that wasn't wasn't compelling evidence. I think the possession of a murder weapon 90 days after the, the murder is compelling evidence of, of, uh, of guilt. Uh, not only that, uh, had Hudson testified, he, as, uh, as McDuffie, as was the case with McDuffie, there would have been a, a, a disputed accomplice instruction that, uh, that would have weighed uh, against his credibility along with his five uh, 
uh, theft, uh, prior convictions for theft-related theft offenses. So you take that, I think you, you take his testimony uh, of what he would have testified and how it would have been favorable to the defendant and weigh it against the demerits of his testimony as he testified at the Ginther hearing. And I don't think the defendant has shown a reasonable probability of a substantial likelihood of a different result, that is, an acquittal of the defendant by the jury. So, I, Mr. Chambers, I find these, these, this, this question always hard in any case. Um, how, do you, how do you figure out how, whether, whether it would have made a difference? And, um, I, and in your brief, you, 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 you mostly just block quoted the Court of Appeals prejudice um, analysis, so I assume you found that persuasive. Um, there was no, there were no, the, the, the trial judge did not find Michael Hudson not credible, right? So we have no, cred, we, don't, we have no adverse credibility finding about right. Hudson. Right, the, the trial judge never addressed the question of prejudice. Nor, nor did the trial judge address, to make any finding that Hudson was not credible, correct? That's correct. Okay. Although the, the trial judge did note that Hudson had his, his own baggage as far as those uh, five, five prior theft convictions. Yeah, yeah. McDuffie's got a, he doesn't have a clean record either, right? I'm sorry? McDuffie doesn't have a clean record either. So if it's a he said, he said, right, I've got, your point is, yeah, Hudson could have been impeached with his prior convictions, but McDuffie had some too, and it's a he said, he said. So... Uh, and I don't know, I mean, McDuffie's is pending. I, I, mean, I don't know how a jury weighs. You tell me you're, you prosecute cases. But you, I mean, it, it, are, are Hudson's theft convictions that are 10 and 12 years old um, worse than a pending, you know, McDuffie is getting a benefit from testifying in this case. Well, and the benefit I, I, is the dismissal of his probation violation, which, what was that for, by the way? What was the probation violation for? Uh, uh, I think it was for absconding from parole, I think. He was absconding? You know, at the time he, he showed up for this hearing, he was, he was, on a, he was a, a parole absconder. That's why he was arrested after his testimony at that hearing. So he had an absconding violation, which was therefore going to obviously undermine the, his HIDA status in the pending gun charge of his own, right? Well, I don't think we could have could have impeached him with the fact that he was a parole absconder. You know, oh, but I, I'm just trying to understand what benefit he got from testifying. And it's, I, I, am I correct to understand that he both... Oh, wait. Oh, you're talking about McDuffie? I'm talking about McDuffie. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, McDuffie, he, uh, I think he was on uh, HIDA status, yep. and, and that was going to be dismissed. I believe that was the... the uh, the promise that he got for testifying for us. So is the is the benefit of the, a dismissal of your underlying I don't know what he, the height of charge I think was for a gun charge is that correct? I CCW. CCW. For, uh, Does that benefit make you more believable or less believable than the guy who ten years ago had three theft offenses? I don't. How, how do you how, how do you weigh well, this? Well, I I don't think it's just. It's, it's not just that Hudson had these prior theft convictions. I think you also have to uh, uh, go back to the gun tossing incident. Yeah. These guys were, in, at 1 o'clock in the morning, they were dressed in, in dark clothing, and I think they were casing this pizza place. Okay. And that's what the, the police thought. And so the police approached them. That's when they started walking away. Defendant kicked his gun under the car. Hudson kicked his gun under the car. At the Ginther hearing, Hudson testified. I asked Hudson, did you see the defendant kick the gun under the car? No, I, di I didn't see anything. I didn't see him kick anything under the car. You know, if, and that was so directly I contrary to what the police officer testified to. And, and my point is, is that, and as the Court of Appeals indicated too, that testimony indicates that Hudson's going to go to, considers, the defendant, his, his pal, and so he's I, going to say anything to exonerate him in a crime. I read your brief, and you, when you quoted the Court of Appeals on that point, there were, I think there were three things the Court of Appeals said. So I went and read the transcript because I wanted to see how, you know, what Hudson said as, a, and, and as opposed to what the police officer said. And I guess I don't see the conflict that you're noting. I mean, Hudson said he did not see the defendant kick the gun under the car. Um, but it sounds like he was pretty busy kicking his own gun under the car. And the fact that the gun, the defendant possessed that gun was not disputed. The defendant pled guilty to that. So I, I guess I'm missing 
why the fact that Hudson didn't watch the defendant at the time he himself was uh, being arrested and um, kicking his own under the car is is very relevant. I mean, I think what well, your point is he's a he's a accomplice, at least we know, in in, in the gun kicking incident to the defendant. So therefore, he may well be, um, you know, a jury could find that he's he wants to give favorable testimony to the defendant. But McDuffie's their accomplice too, right? Like they're they're all in this together. They were all apparently in the car together when this homicide happened. Correct. That's why the, the uh, that that's why there was an accomplice instruction for McDuffie as yeah. there would have been for Hudson. So accomplice, accomplice, right. benefit for testimony, ten year old prior convictions. I'm I'm still I'm still thinking I, I might want to I might want to put them up there if I'm you know if 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 this is my case. Well, I, I that the police officer testified that. When they approached, you know, the police officer, talking about the gun tossing incident, the police officer testified that the two of them, defendant and Hudson, walked in between these two cars. Then it yeah. was defendant who first dropped his gun and kicked it under a car. And then it was Hudson who uh, in, followed suit and kicked his gun under the same car. I think that, I don't think a jury would have believed that that Hudson didn't see the defendant kick the gun under the car when he kicks his gun under the same car that the defendant kicked his gun under. But but Hudson said in the same Hudson said later that he knew that the defendant pled guilty to possession of that gun, so he was fully aware and fully admitted at the hearing that the defendant had that gun. So the discrepancy Not, he, in when he, he saw there was no admission that defendant had that gun. There was an admission that de defendant had pled guilty to possession of a firearm. That was the stipulation. It was still a, a, you know, the attorney st in opening statement still he 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 indicated that there would be some doubt as to the de whether the defendant actually had that murder weapon or not. Now it didn't really. That was a weird out, thing to say was, since he had pled guilty to it, right? <laughs> well, he, the defendant pled guilty to possession of a firearm. If you if you read the the, the defendant's plea transcript uh, where he uh, pleads guilty to that that firearm count, he doesn't say it's a Glock. He just says it was, you know, it was a firearm. So that was not established by his guilty plea. Counsel, I've, I've had a problem that I've been a little troubled with in this case, and maybe I'm confused in some respect, but I look at this as a fairly substantial case. You had a couple of eyewitnesses. Their identification seemed to conform with uh, that of the defendant. He was seen in the possession of the uh, murderous firearm. So I consider it a fairly strong case. Um, what do you do in those circumstances? Do you analyze this by suggesting that any error in either the investigation or eventually deciding to put a witness on the stand was erroneous because it was such a reasonably compelling case? Or do you suggest at that point that maybe there would have been very little to lose by throwing a Hail Mary in that situation and putting somebody uh, before the jury. What, what is the right approach that somebody in the appellate process ought to take in that well, context? Well, a, a reviewing court can, at, at the time that, that a reviewing court gets the case, they have to, they, they have to determine prejudice. Everything is, you know, what's done is done. That there, you have to, in order to determine prejudice, I think that requires a weighing of evidence. Like you say, if, if there was a, a substantial case against the defendant, that's got to, uh, that has to be taken into account. It does, but what would the harm have been of pursuing the investigation and at that point deciding, you know, what, what was there to gain, but also what was there to lose at that juncture? Well, there was, there was, there would have been nothing there would have been nothing to lose in interviewing Hudson. I admit that. The, the conscientious thing to do for that attorney were to do to see, let's see what Hudson says. Let's just, let's see what he's going to say. And then at that point, I think the attorney could uh, make the determination that there, this guy's got too much baggage. He's going to, he's not going to put the, he's going to put the murder weapon in my client's hands. Because he's going to say he's not going to admit that he's the one that kicked the murder weapon under the car. He's going to, so he's going to put the murder weapon in the defendant's hands. 
I mean, the murder weapon had changed hands, presumably, arguably several times between the time well, of the, the murder and the... According to McDuffie, the murder, the murder weapon had originally uh, belonged to some guy named Terry, and then Norman Clark got it from Terry. Norman Clark, who was also a buddy of the defendants and Hudson's and, and uh, McDuffie's, and uh, I don't the I don't think that I don't see how I don't know how it would have played for the attorney to argue. Well, you know, in the criminal world, you know, ch guns change hands, so that explains why my client had that murder weapon. I don't know how I don't think that would have played very well with the jury, you know, and that's the only way he would have been able to explain it. I think. And then if you would explain it that way, that would have corroborated what McDuffie said. McDuffie said, yeah, it passed from Norman Clark. And, but McDuffie also said, and, and it, it, it's corroborated by that gun-tossing incident, McDuffie said that the, the gun that the defendant shot the, the uh, deceased with was a Glock. And what is the gun that the defendant threw under the car but a Glock? And also, there's there's also corroboration from McDuffie's testimony. Uh, in other instances, McDuffie said that they were all in a black, neon, or a Malibu, a sedan. Uh, one of the witnesses, Adam McGreer, testified that the type of car that pulled up next to him was a black Lumina. Those are all sedans. Uh, McDuffie said that the vehicle that they pulled up next to was a dark green SUV. Well, the fact is that the, the, the vehicle that the deceased was in was a SUV. It, was, it happened to be black, but I can see how you could mistake black with dark green at, at the time of night that, that this occurred. So that also corroborated McDuffie's testimony. So I, I think that in the, in the end, if this court agrees that there was that with the Court of Appeals that prejudice wasn't shown, it doesn't really need to address the question of whether counsel's performance was deficient in not interviewing this witness. Although I think the case law is that the failure to interview a witness is not per se ineffective assistance of counsel if you have other sources of information that makes the, your, your decision not to interview the witness reasonable and that's what this attorney had in this case. He knew that Hudson and the defendant were caught uh, um, kicking guns under the car and that Hudson was going to testify likely that he was not the one that kicked the murder weapon under the car, it was the defendant. So puts the murder weapon in the defendant's hands. Thank you, Mr. Chambers. Thank you very much. Ms. Marcus. It's reasonably likely that competent counsel would have called Michael Hudson as a witness because his testimony was exculpatory. It directly contradicted Sean McDuffie's. There was a negative inference to be drawn without his testimony, but also, and this is something that, that Mr. Chambers was just, we were just talking about with him, it, it wouldn't have harmed um, Mr. Pippin in any way. There was no question at trial that Mr. Pippin um, kicked this gun under this car three months, three months after the murder in this case. A police officer testified that not only did he see Mr. Pippin kick this Glock, that he saw the Glock um, come out of Mr. Pippin's waistband. So it, it's really, there's no, it wasn't in dispute. Um, and, and there's no reason why one would forego Mr. Hudson's extremely important testimony because he would um, accentuate that in any way. Hmm. Justice Markman, you mentioned the, the identifications in this case. I, I disagree that the identification testimony was strong or really mattered in any way. The, and really, the prosecutor used the identification to say, you know, if you think it's one of these three guys, this looks more like Mr. Pippin um, than these other two individuals. One, two of the individuals in the car testified that um, 
that the shooter was tallish, taller than average, and um, one of the individuals said that she believed he had a thinner build. And she agreed that both Mr. Pippin and his trial attorney fit that description. Um, the, the man in the car that said that the shooter was taller than average also initially said that the shooter had a dark complexion, um, which Mr. Pippin does not. He has a very light complexion. So, you know, really, um, the best that the prosecutor could do with that at trial was saying, you know, if you think it was one of these three guys, this looks more like Mr. Pippin. But Mr. Pippin has maintained throughout um, that he had nothing to do with this. He was not present. Um, and, and he's completely innocent of this crime. We ask that the court reverse and remand for a new trial and also clarify the legal principles governing ineffectiveness claims where um, the claim is based on a failure to investigate. And the court doesn't have to break any new ground in doing this. There's clear Supreme Court precedent on point, um, but still our lower courts uh, continue to get it wrong. Thank and, you. and the best of those cases just if you would conclude with what you believe is the best of our precedents in terms of that proposition. The best of For our failure to investigate. What, 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 do you, what law makes it so easy? Oh, Wiggins v. Smith, um, Kimmelman v. Morrison are the two United Supreme Court cases um, that are directly on point. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. We stand adjourned.